Good evening, and welcome to our 2024 kickoff of the Maine Public Book Club. I'm your host, Bill Nemitz, and tonight we'll be talking about Lungfish, a brilliant and haunting novel by Megan Gillis. This is Megan's first novel after years of short fiction work, and it's receiving widespread acclaim across the country, including its designation as an editor's choice by the uh, New York Times Book Review. So we're starting off with a bang here. If you've ever spent any time on or just off the main coast, I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate how well this story captures the beauty, the mystery, and yes, the hardship that comes with scratching out a living where the land and the sea sometimes blur into one. We have tons to talk about with Megan, and thanks, by the way, to all of you who have already submitted questions to me for her. Uh, if you'd like to join in with a question or comment during our conversation, send it over to fun at mainpublic.org, and I'll try to work it into the discussion. But before we get to Megan, who joins us tonight from Portland, I assume, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I first would like to recognize our sponsors, uh, Bull Moose again and Coffee by Design again this year for their generous support of the club. Without their help, events like this would not be possible. So thank you to both. I also want to recognize our bookstore partners, in addition to Bull Moose, where many of you secured your copy of Lungfish, thanks to Book Stacks in Bucksport, None Such Books and More in South Portland, Mockingbird Bookshop in Bath, Sherman's Main Coast Bookshops, DDG Booksellers in Farmington, Left Bank Books in Belfast, and Print in Portland. One final note, check your emails as we are giving out five subscriptions to Audio Audiophile Magazine and one subscription to Decor Maine around every book club event this year. Our thanks to both of those organizations for coming aboard. So with that, let's get started. Megan, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's good to see you. Uh, I don't normally do this. Uh, to start off by asking about a book's title. But mm. in this case, I uh, before I started reading the book, I actually decided to learn more about lungfish, which completely creeped me out, by the way. Sure. <laughs> but, but as I got into the book, uh, it, it all made sense to me. You know, I, I got into the story. It fit perfectly. So first and foremost, tell us how you arrived at that name. Uh, what made you decide to use that as a name? There's a brief allusion to it in the book, but obviously it, it, it got a lot more thought than that from you. Where did the name come from? Well, it didn't come from me. <clears throat> uh -huh but it did come from the book um so yeah first just to introduce other folks who might not know what the lungfish is it is a prehistoric prehistoric fish still around that lives on the african and australian continents um it has these sort of fins that allow it to walk on the substrate um it can walk into the mud essentially of a riverbank um, as a drought descends, and then they sort of coat themselves in their own mucus to make a little cocoon, and they can just stay dried out and cocooned like that for years until the rains return and <clears throat> water moves through and they can <clears throat> set themselves loose again. Um, so that's what a lungfish is. Why is that the title? One, because the working title of this novel was Islanders which uh, the people at my publisher wisely pointed out would be buried under a million different books of very similar titles if people were trying to find this book right. by a debut author. So there was sort of a marketing angle to, to changing the name. Um, but more meaningfully, um, it, you know, it is a, just a small, simple metaphor um, about surviving deprivation. Mm -hmm. And dry spells. This book has um, explores the theme of deprivation to at length. I guess I would say so. Um, yeah, it's just a simple metaphor plucked from the book. Our narrator Tuck is sort of talking <clears throat> to us, the reader, um, about what she knows about the lungfish, and um, to it, me. It can go a long time. 
It can go a long time without eating. <laughs> go a long time without eating. Yes, this book has a lot. As you all know, I forget, this is an audience who presumably has read the book already, so we don't have to explain that. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's a big right. focus on finding food in this book. Yeah. So um, that is the origin story of the name. It was the book had no title for a long time, which made me feel like the book had no <laughs> reason to exist. It was a very horrifying, I don't know, four months or so. Um, and then somebody um, at Catapult um, suggested the name Longfish. And as soon as I oh. heard it, I thought it was perfect. Yeah, it fit. It, like I said, it fit perfectly. And, and long before I got to the Longfish reference in it, it fit perfectly. It's because what Tuck is doing is in many ways very, it runs parallel with, with what that Longfish is doing at the same time. Uh, you must have been scratching your head for a little while, though. That's yeah, I was. Well, I, 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 having, knowing what a Lungfish was, I kept come, I kept saying, come on, you got to introduce the Lungfish. But I knew that they don't live in Maine waters. So it was, you know, it was a, a metaphorical reference. I knew it was going to be metaphorical and not actual, but who knows. Uh, as I said earlier, your writing uh, consisted mostly of short fiction uh, before you did this, and it it got me and others wondering about this transition that you just made. I'm going to actually switch to one of our uh, one of our audience members who who asked, "How different is writing short fiction versus a novel?" This is your first novel, so I am super curious if you approached it differently than your shorter pieces. I did because I think with the shorter pieces, <clears throat> I pretty quickly because a draft would come together fairly quickly, I pretty quickly had a sense of where it was all going. Um, and then very quickly, the process became about tweaking everything along the way to get it to where it was going. Whereas with this project, it was so much more like writing a lot of very short fiction, you know, sentence long scraps, paragraph long scraps, just doing that daily as a practice and just putting absolute faith for better or for worse in the idea that it would eventually all add up. Now you mean liter literal scraps like post-it note oh. scraps? Oh, oh yes, okay. yes, yeah, yeah. I, um, I was a full-time working mother while I was writing this book, so, and I would say mother of a child who refuses to be more than at the age refused to be more than a foot away from me awake or asleep so it was a real battle to find any time to do any writing so most of this book i shouldn't say most <clears throat> a lot of this book came together while i was working um at a circ desk of a public library actually and i would sort of have enough downtime that you know sentences would get distilled in my head i'd be inspired by something and i would jot a little again, a sentence, a fact, something that I'd picked up down and sort of stuff it under the keyboard. And at the end of the day, I'd have this <laughs> stack of scraps. Um, at the end of a good day, I'd have a stack. Did you have like a storyboard somewhere? Or, or how did you organize them or? or, or Eventually, that was the hard part. <laughs> yeah, that was the horrible. Yeah, that was a slog. But yes, huh. that that involved. Yeah, so really, they did just accumulate. And I really yeah. put a lot of trust in that process. And there's a writer who I really greatly admire named Mary Robeson, who wrote this incredible book, Why Did I Ever? And she purportedly um, had been experiencing severe writer's block and so just drove around her town um, with like a stack of post-it notes in her car and would just, you know, when something came to her as she's driving through town, pull over, write it down. Mm -hmm. slap it on the window or whatever um and that is how her book came about so um hmm, that's, that's like a good thing. approach to me i was like i think yeah. yeah i think if i can write a novel that's the way i'm gonna do it as long as you post them high enough that your daughter can't get at them right yeah. <laughs> or, or, <laughs> I, I, I shudder to think what could happen then uh yeah. now you i understand grew up in kentucky correct did. and yeah. uh and it lived in various places around the country. We're going to touch back on that in a bit because in one of those roles, uh, you were a journalist. Uh, sure. And I believe you, you told me earlier you came to Maine in 2010. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, but but you were no stranger to Maine. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I have had the, the great fortune in my life to 
have access to a place that very much resembles the house and the island in this novel. Um, I grew up in the summers coming to visit my grandmother in her island house up here. Um, a little closer to shore than the island in this book, um, but very similar in that it was completely off the grid, <coughs> not, um, not a luxurious stay, very much sort of um, an earthy, rustic place. Mm -hmm. No um, ferry, I assume. What's that? No ferry, I assume. No ferry oh, to the mainland. Ferry. No, fer no, fer no ferry service, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I did grow up learning how to drive, you know, their old wooden dory, you know, back and forth, which, um, you know, now the trip that we would take to get to the island, um, back then in the dory, it would take like 45 minutes. So psychically, this island was like, whew, way out there and we only made trips to shore if we really had to now of course with these <clears throat> newfangled boats um we can zip around pretty quickly and it's changed the place psychically but um oh, sure that makes me yeah, wonder so <laughs> uh, you you're on the island as a girl girl uh, summers so that instantly makes me think uh, we'll get into the book in a bit but it just makes me think of little agnes uh yeah on the island did you have did you see similarities there between your experiences and hers just the sheer discovery of it all and the freedom to roam is something you can do on an island that a young child might not be able to do on the mainland yeah absolutely yeah uh, being with her in that place has been one of the greatest gifts of my life for sure and she loves it as much as i do and it's just been so fun to watch her discover mm -hmm. every little inch of it um you know and she does she is growing up with that same fear of loss that i have always had and that is also carried through in this novel i think a lot of people with these types of who are lucky enough obviously to have these types of homes in maine are up against this um mm -hmm. early generation after generation just so okay how are how are we going to keep this going yeah um, and now with climate change there's another threat you know, oh my girls. gosh, I just saw, yeah, in the Press Herald today, they did us the great favor of like <laughs> printing a, a projected map of the oh, sea yeah. level yeah. in the Gulf of yeah. Maine <laughs> the next 50 years, which is eye opening. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's really daunting. Well, you know, I, I love stories about islands, and, and one of our readers raised this point too. She said, she wanted, was there a reason other than your own personal history that you felt you wanted to have your book take place on an island instead of a different setting? There's, I've always found there to be something kind of mystical about island living. It, was, was that something that you decided? I assume it probably was very early on that that the primary setting for this book was going to be a remote island, correct? Yeah, I mean, I just kind of found myself writing a, about it, bringing it into these scraps that I was writing. I wouldn't say I did it with great intention, but I think, you know, why I ultimately decided when I was at the point when I was um, thinking more critically about what I was doing, um, it obviously it supports the isolation in the book, but it it provides that pressurized isolation that I think is hard. It is hard. To, it would be hard to have a a character so isolated, you know, in a town or even on the mm -hmm. mainland, um, without because of cell phones and the internet and all these ways that were connected to each other, I felt like having a character that is, is as isolated as Tuck, which is entirely normal for a person who has been in the type of relationship that Tuck has been in, I think, but to do that without having to sort of continuously explain to the reader why they don't have people to reach out yeah. to. Yeah, what is, in, in other words, why isn't she bumping into anybody? Yeah. Why isn't That's she bumping into anybody she knows? And I think um, as a writer, I generally try to create situations where I sort of am forced to explain as little as possible. I really want to show and sort of let the reader have the idea themselves. So I really didn't want to find myself in a position of, yeah, of just explaining why Tuck was where 
Yeah. She was. And even her, even her interactions on the mainland are very furtive, I found. You know, she 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 she's selling the bumper sticker kits and all that. And so she is interacting, but always in a way that you get this sense that she's doing this because she has to. And she really wants to get back and focus on the challenges at hand. Uh, yeah. So the people who come and go are very fleeting. And uh, and it, it, it's like there's this gravitational pull that she's got to get back to her isolation, really, and, uh, and figure it out. I'm glad you brought Tuck up because she's uh, obviously the central focus of the story and uh, a very complex woman. Uh, and I got to think that as this book progressed, uh, you developed your own relationship with her. And I'm curious as to uh, the extent in, in in molding this character, the extent to which you uh, related to her as a as a mother, as a daughter, as a wife, all, you know, all these things. Uh, talk talk about I, I guess your relationship with Tuck. What 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 was that like? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Tuck is in some ways. <clears throat> A character who is an extension of many of my own best and worst characteristics. So we we started pretty pretty close. I mean, uh, Tuck is sort of a a stubborn introvert who doesn't like to ask for help. So if we start there, like okay, that's <laughs> that's mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think you know where. Um, where our paths definitely diverge is where I, I really wanted to push Tuck further off of a psychological cliff than I myself tend to go, but that I have in moments found myself going, um, particularly in relation to, you know, loving a person experiencing addiction. So mm -hmm. I really wanted Tuck in a way to preserve and amplify for me a state of mind that I um, discovered through that process of loving, loving somebody experiencing addiction. Um, but I wanted to force that to be more um, sustained because the situation I put Tuck in was very different from any situation that I actually went through. Um, her stakes are sort of were ratcheted up, which I think also ratcheted up her psychological, um, she not, doesn't totally unravel, but she, ha she has her moments. No, it gets um, dark, it gets dark at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, she's and not thinking really, super clearly. Yeah, and it gets dark around among around survival and it gets dark around sustenance and food and and uh when she when she's boiling is it the brackweed am i is that correct the 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 seaweed that she was she was seaweed, yeah. yeah and she's going down and and uh <coughs> I, I told you earlier I, I i went for a walk on the beach the other day and i'm looking down saying who knew you know, all this stuff on the beach, but she's going down and, and it's becoming many times, aside from maybe some saltines and peanut butter or whatever, uh, her, her main source of sustenance. Uh, that, did, how much, did you already know that you could eat all these things or did that require a lot of research on your part? I heard uh, a lot of research. Was that a yeah, I didn't know you could eat, you could just like pick up seaweed from the beaches here and eat it until my daughter at that very young age, she had this urge to eat mm. all of it. And this wasn't, this is totally separate from like the hunger that the Agnes character in the book is experiencing. Sure. This child sure. was just curious, like, can I eat this? And so no. I was unsure, <laughs> I was unsure. Um, if it's wet and rubbery, it goes in the mouth. So I'm sure her desire to eat the seaweed and watching her eat the seaweed somehow got into my, you know, psyche and came out on those little scraps of paper that I was, you know, writing when I was at the library. So I'm sure she planted that seed for me. But yeah, in terms of like doing research about what was edible and just like 
the names of plants and things in general, I had to do a ton. I, you know, I grew up very much feeling like a nature kid. I, you know, I've always preferred being outside to being inside. I've always, you know, loved this particular island that, you know, I sort of modeled the one in the book after. But I was never like, I wasn't raised to know the names of mm -hmm. things or really to understand the interconnectedness of it. Um, I just sort of took it all as like part of the experience that was there for me. So I really did have to dig in um, and start learning about all the life, which was in a way I just kind of came full circle actually, because what I realized in doing all that research and learning all of these names is I realized in a way I feel less like an idiot now. Like I know the names of these plants that grow in the place that I love, yeah, yeah. but those are just the names that humans gave the things. Like it doesn't change the fact of them one, one bit. Right. I actually, <laughs> I actually feel like maybe I was appreciating them better before I knew the names of all of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we sometimes, we like to have sometimes the author, our authors do a little reading, and I understand you've selected something that that might pertain to this. Would you like to do that now? Sure. Yeah, I can <clears throat> read a page or so. I um, you probably noticed I have a little cough going, so. I hope I can get, oh, okay. <laughs> get through this, but um, yeah, I don't know if I've read this a little bit out loud before, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah. <clears throat> the impatience is a sudden shrill shrieking in my skull. I can't do this. We're still stuck out here. I know exactly where they are, but Agnes won't lie down. I pull my hand back so it won't shove her head down against her pillow and hold it there. I clasp my hands behind my back and take a breath. It's probably her hunger keeping her from settling down. It's probably mine, which I know she also feels. We double the feeling by knowing each other too much. I close my eyes and try to let the shrieking drain out, try to let it be replaced by the outside shrieking of Agnes. Let him see us like this. I take a breath. I walk out the door. She'll wear herself out and fall asleep, I know. I just want her to do it quickly. She's wasting calories on this. Hmm. I snap the batteries out of the kitchen radio and drop them back into my flashlight. They bounce against the springs and settle into place. I stand on tiptoe and with the tips of my fingers coax my grandmother's cherry wood bowl from the top of the cabinet and, he and head out into the dark my beam picking up the sideways rain that strikes my cheek. We'd seen them earlier. Our rule is no mushrooms, but everyone knows you can eat chanterelles. I cast my beam about until it lights up the orange profusion. I fill my bowl. It's a solid, well-made thing, and it feels good between my stomach and the crook of my arm. In the kitchen, wet and hungry, I stand still and listen. She must be asleep. The pain is swift and sharp. There are more and more of these moments when she's better off without me, the disturbances I bring. I spread the mushrooms on the table beneath the hanging bulb, bright caps down, ridged undersides up. The glowing stems stretch upward toward the ceiling. Drops of water slide down the ridges and pool at the pale furls along the edges of the caps. I look at them. You are chanterelles, right? I say. My pamphlet intentionally does not deal with mushrooms. But the little paperback field guide from my grandmother's shelf is opened to the correct page, face down, on the table. They are, as far as I can possibly tell, chanterelles. There's still a little of my grandmother's lard left in the ceramic jar next to the stove. I put a small amount into her heavy cast iron pan and leave it to warm while I slide a knife through a single mushroom, slicing it into thin slivers. I drop the slivers into the pan and let the heat and lard move into them, make them even more tender. My mouth is filled with saliva and a nauseating hunger is rising up from the pit of me. I eat the pieces out of the pan as slowly as I can. I want more. I want more even if it will kill me. But I sit at the table with the uncooked mushrooms spread before me, 
the heat off under the pan until morning. If I'm still fine then, I'll cut the remaining mushrooms into unrecognizable bits and fry them up for breakfast for Agnes and me. I'll serve them with, what, with what's left of the rice. Then we'll have a little more for lunch and a little more for dinner. When I wake up, his fingers are on the curve of my back. A horse caught in a field, picked up by hurricane winds and dropped down here, the others all dead, lying on their sides. Its eyes, I know, are far from still. Tuck. This isn't meandering, I say. Meandering isn't accurate here. Hmm. Hmm. I remember reading that and having two reactions. Number one is, don't eat the mushrooms. But, on, <laughs> but the other one was when you started talking about uh, adding the rice and, and all that. I, 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 it made me hungry. I mean, it sounded, in the context, it sounded, it sounded absolutely delicious, you know, and it's amazing how, you know, depending on the circumstances, uh, something so simple can be actually something so uh, elegant. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting that you said, you were saying, don't eat the mushrooms, because I know that, oh, so sorry, hang on. Uh, yeah. We talked about the fact that might happen. Yeah. Uh, so for every one of you saying, don't eat the mushrooms, there are those people saying, eat the mushrooms. That place is loaded with, <laughs> with mushrooms. Exactly. Exactly. Which I, if think, you know what, like, I think that's like the, I think that's the like mind spiral that Tuck is stuck inside. of is like how to make sense of what is safe and reasonable and what is not safe and reasonable. And in a way, I think that's how all of us parents feel right now about every decision that we have to make <laughs> regarding the way we raise our children and the things we allow them to do. Yeah. Until you finally just have to make a decision. Which you, is have, yeah, you, you have to just find center um, yeah. Yeah. and make yeah. a decision. I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I also want to talk about Paul. Uh, at times in this story, he's invisible, as in not there at all, or if he is there, uh, barely noticeable, you know, no more than a piece of furniture. Uh, at other times, I found myself actually rooting for him as, as he was maybe, maybe coming around, uh, yet I never felt fully confident that, that he'd pull away completely from his addiction. Uh, I, I'd like to hear your description of his trajectory uh, in his and Tuck's marriage, um, from the highest highs to the lowest lows, because there were, as I said, there, there were a few flickers of hope, like when he starts working on the boat with Sharon, and you're thinking, well, maybe, you know, uh, yet in the end, uh, it's not to be. Uh, how hard was it to not only create Paul, but to, as, as the writer, to keep your distance from him. Yeah, so it was, it was important for me all along for his character to be defined by his absence. I wanted his, his absence really to be the thing around with which Tuck was working and moving around. Um, you know, it felt important to puncture that just occasionally to give the reader a sense of of who he was and i and i think that was that was the most difficult part was figuring out how and when to puncture that absence because it's really really sad when a good person becomes addicted to to drugs right like it's really really sad the you know the the fall from the best version of themselves to the worst version of themselves is merciless. Mm -hmm. um, what I learned really early on as a writer is that, at least for me, like it's really easy to make readers cry. And it felt, it felt very much like it would have taken very little for this story to sort of turn into just a sob story about, yeah, you know, this yeah. wonderful man who got addicted and then messed up this whole family situation, yeah. right? And 
that just wasn't the part of the story that I wanted to be the, the focus. And I felt there wasn't, there was such risk at having that sort of take over the rest if it was allowed in. So Paul has always kept, I think the reader has always kept from knowing him to a degree um, for that reason. And I, <clears throat> what was the second part of your question, Bill? Um, well, you, you've addressed it, uh, you know, keeping him at length. It sounds to me like what you're saying is you didn't want Paul to take over the story. I didn't want him or like the sadness of it to take over yeah. the story. Yeah, yeah right. I was so much more interested in exploring this strange psychological space that one occupies yeah. when loving somebody experiencing sure. addiction. Sure. I have a question uh, from uh, Martha who, who asked, what was your familiarity with addiction before writing Lungfish? You've alluded to this, uh, but you you clearly write about it with with uh, with some knowledge uh, um, the whole concept although his addiction is a little strange in that it's not your typical you know heroin or or yeah. any of the drugs it's this uh, kratom yeah which is actually used in recovery i understand but but anyway what martha martha's wondering you know what you bring to this story in terms of being able to write that knowledgeably about it yeah i think you know i um, my own relationship to addiction is quite, is fairly similar to Tuck's, you know, circumstantially different, but emotionally very similar. Um, and that, you know, I was a person who was very blindsided by another person's addiction and sort of did the same, um, performed the same acts of denial that, that mm -hmm. Tuck performs. So, um, yeah, came to this story with, um, I wrote this, I wrote this book in real time as I was learning how to deal with a loved oh. one's addiction, well, that's yeah. which, yeah, which I think, um, you know, I was worried about. I've, I have heard it said by very good writers that you shouldn't write about, you know, sort of big emotional things until you have distance and clarity on those events um, in your life. And to me, writing this book throughout that process was sort of a compulsive act. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Tuck sort of became almost like an avatar, I guess, for feeling her way, you know, feeling my way through a such an emotional situation. Like I said, the details of the situation were very different. Mm -hmm. um, I put certain constraints on on Tuck to sort of ratchet things up. Um, but Tuck was very much sort of exploring the situation in the same ways that I was. Um, and a did lot of that that, was... did you find that therapeutic yourself as you wrote it? In the I mean, end, it... maybe like six years later, it was probably the slowest possible <laughs> form of therapy. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, the the traditional advice would be like, go to some like family, you know, support groups and talk to others who are going through the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Get an individual right. counselor. All of that is probably all very good advice, just not my way of learning. Um, I think my way of learning is and always has been through through writing. I often don't know what I think until I've tried writing. Um, yeah, and I'm your choice of the choice of drug was was interesting, especially the the whole you know a, a whole subplot becomes the discovery of the drug and you know what is this? I guess smell would be the best way to describe it. But, you know, the, I mean, but it was more than that. It was almost like a presence. And then Tuck is, you know, uh, she's basically, you know, going out of her mind trying to figure out what this is. And then finally she makes the discovery. Uh, it would have been so much easier just to say the guy, uh, you know, the guy had a heroin addiction or he had a, uh, you know, any, you, you chose not to do that. Was that just to add a plot twist or why, why, the, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, the Kratom? 
Yeah, uh, people say it that way. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a good question and so true. And I did, um, you know, as I began to revise the novel, I thought, should, should I just change this to heroin? Like, am I, yeah. is this too sort of niche? Does it make this particular experience too specific to really be a, a you know, for people to be able to extrapolate something larger from it or for you know more people to feel connected to it um but in the end i think two, there were two important reasons i decided to just keep kratom in the story which one i think that it, paul's addiction to kratom is so confusing to tuck and mm -hmm. tuck never fully understands his relationship to it um or the the ways he was using it or or why and i think other people's addictions always remain a mystery to us i think if we think we understand them we're really fooling ourselves um i think for everything we think we know about somebody else's addiction there's so much that we we don't know and i was afraid that if i did a step just to sort of make part of the story simpler and switch it to heroin that people would think they understood. Yeah. Okay. That's people, a good point. Like right off the addiction, like, yeah. oh yeah, I, get, I understand what that's about. They'd um, relate it to someone in their life, that kind of thing. Yeah. At best related to, to somebody in their life. Yes. Cause I think in that case, they might actually like be more likely to understand the complexity of it. But for those who don't have, who are fortunate enough to, you know, I know these numbers are dwindling now, but to not, you right. know, have a friend or family member who has experienced addiction of one form or another, I think it just becomes too easy with heroin to just write it, to write it off and think you know everything about it. Um, sure. So, yeah. you know, Tuck never fully understands Paul's addiction in this novel. My intention was for the, to reader, the reader to have enough information to feel like they could in the end land somewhere, like have a theory about what his, you know, drug use trajectory was, but not to feel totally confident about it. Um, yeah. I wanted that sort of ground to remain a little shifty under their feet. Um, well, we have one comment from, from an audience member who, that, that actually relates to that. Uh, this person first writes, I really enjoyed your book. I could almost feel your hunger pains while you were foraging for food. Paul's struggles with addiction sure affected the whole family. My question, when Agnes told her mother about the needle tree she saw on her walk with Papa, was Paul stashing used needles there? I thought, this person says, I thought he was afraid of heroin because he did not want to die. Does that resonate? Yeah, it's so funny. I. <clears throat> I think I told you, Bill, I haven't read through to the end of this book in, yeah. in a while because, right, you know, right. I finished right. writing this book almost, I think, about two years ago now. And um, right. I've been reading a lot from the first half and I just finally had the opportunity to read it all the way through. So I just re-encountered the needle tree. Um, I think it is very fair to um, draw from that the conclusion that, yes, Paul was stashing needles under there. And I think, you know, we have Tuck asking oh my gosh did through the choices that i forced on my husband did i did i force him to to switch to heroin from from kratom um hmm. having you know restricted his access to the mainland in the way that she did where he only had these fleeting moments you know right. at the at the docks. She, she thought she'd restricted his access it turns out maybe not so much but uh but right. it was a great plan while it lasted. You know, yeah. To yeah. Keep him on the boat. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, you can you can very much not want to die and let your overwhelming need to feel like you're not going your overwhelming feeling that you are going to die if you don't put something into your body that's gonna make you feel better. Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna go yeah. there. Right. I also uh, wanna touch upon the whole concept of motherhood in this story. Uh, there are lots of mothers when you think about it. I mean, there's obviously there's Tuck, uh, but there's her mother. Uh, there's Sharon, who has her own motherhood, her burden 
from motherhood to carry. Uh, I, rem I thought as I was pondering this, even at the end, there's the horse at the end who, whose foal ends up being bottle fed by Agnes. Uh, and so that, that kind of thread runs throughout the story. Uh, distilling that in some case, in some ways I saw real parallels between Tuck's life and her mother's life uh, in others, namely parenting, not so much. But there, did you intend for there to be kind of a, you know, circular aspect to that? That what happened with with Tuck's parents, the mother with with a father who, you know, they obviously weren't connecting, and she finally said, "I'm out of here. I've had it." Uh, all these years later, Tuck found herself confronting the same thing for different reasons. Uh, but did you see parallels there? Yeah, I mean the theme of the theme of motherhood obviously was very much on my mind. I would say, you know, in terms of my intentions, you know, initially they were not clear to me, but what I found was happening was that sort of like the like the motherness of all of these characters was being subverted by some new understanding of that character and I I read something I think it was after I had finished working on this, but um, read the memoir, um, A Life's Work on Becoming a Mother by Rachel Cusk, um, in which she said, like, she said, you know, as a mother, you learn what it is to be a martyr and, uh, and a devil. Um, and she said, in motherhood, I experienced myself as more virtuous uh, and more terrible and more implicated too in the world's virtue and terror than I would from the anonymity of childlessness have thought hmm. possible. Hmm. And I was really interested in this idea of how motherhood suddenly like force you in this whole new realm of judgment, right? Like were the things you ordinarily would have done without anybody caring one way or the other suddenly became points of judgment, right? Like, the, like right. <laughs> all of right. a sudden the world is watching you, <laughs> like you're examining defining, your you're choices yeah, and yeah. deciding whether you're, you're good or bad. And I think, you know, just because I was writing this book as a new mother, I think that was very much on my mind. Um, and I didn't, so yeah, I didn't necessarily set out to say one thing or another about it, but I did find myself sort of constantly turning over the characters where I felt like an action was good or bad. Well, what I had to do was actually flip that over and see how the opposite was actually sort yeah. of true. Two sides to every story, kind of. Yeah. 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 Uh, Another reader asked, and, and I always ask this question myself, I think it might be, uh, answer might be fairly self-evident here, but is there a character that you, that you empathize with the most? What character do you like the most in the book and why? <laughs> well, I mean, I like Agnes the most. Tuck, of course, uh, drives me crazy because she's too similar, yeah, <laughs> too, too similar yeah. to myself. Um, I think I think Paul does have a great heart, you know, in there. We just don't get to see a whole lot of it in this mm -hmm. book. So I do I do love Paul. I feel like I've failed when readers say they can't stand him. Like I Oh, I really? Want, Some people I, huh. I do want his actions to drive them crazy. I want people to be furious with him. Yeah, yeah. But I don't want them to hate him or think he's a monster or anything like well, that. Well, going back to what I said earlier about Paul, given everything, when Tuck makes this decision, and it's a hard, but it's a fast decision, that she's going to the other island and, you know, packs up and, and ships out, literally. Uh, I, I, I ended up, I couldn't, I couldn't completely suppress my sympathy for Paul. That, you know, you're on your own now, pal. You know, it, this is it. You're, you're, you know, it's sink or swim on your own. And uh, so at least, you know, I, I, I he, he was a, just a very complex character for all the little we knew of him. Even, you know, he was still 
a real presence. And uh, there were I kept I just kept oscillating on him back and forth right to the end, you know. Uh, yeah. Where I, I have one other here that is along the same line. It, it seems there are always scenes that don't make it into a final edit of a novel. Was that the case with you? Or was there any particular scene that you struggled over not including? Yeah. <clears throat> In my earliest drafts, um, Tuck's brother, Conrad, actually shows up. <clears throat> he showed up. Um, at the island, I mean, on the <laughs> on the mainland, but Tuck runs yeah. into him there. Um, and he stays on the island for a week or so before he goes off to, you know, tend to his own messed up life. Um, but it felt so good to have this sibling energy on the page for a little while. Um, and I felt like it gave Tuck an opportunity to see herself as somebody else would. You know how our siblings call us on all, oh, yeah. on all, yeah. on all our stuff. They don't let us get away with anything. So yeah. he sort of, you know, forced Tuck to see herself as he might be seeing her. Um, and so I felt make, like, why didn't, that? Make, why didn't he make the cut? So this was a conversation I had with my editor, where you know she was saying, "This is a book about isolation. We have." three characters like we need to keep it we need to keep it lean like this we need to keep it focused on the isolation you start bringing in more characters you sort of break that that tightness um and she didn't think tuck's visit was necessary or that conrad's visit was necessary at all i was saying yes it is look it makes her see herself and then she starts making different choices she becomes self-aware all of a sudden and she, you know she had the great point she said well could that happen a different way? Does she need him for that? Yeah. Does she need him for that? Does he have to be the character who does that? And so I very begrudgingly took that scene out and then realized, oh, Sharon's that person. That is Sharon's role in this story, is to make Tuck self-conscious, self-aware, to see herself you know, as another would see her. So then I you know, got to start inserting all these scenes about Tuck watching Sharon and Sharon watching Tuck and the way Tuck feels when Sharon's watching her, um, which I ended up really loving because I don't think that um, Sharon's role in their life had been really fully explored just yeah. yet. So it gave me yeah. the opportunity to really um, dig deep into that. You know, that raises another question for me because with this, if staying focused on Tuck and her her journey really throughout this whole thing um i'm not sure if you'd ever even can you know if you've ever pondered the idea of a spin-off but if you were to which there are threads here you know there's her new life that she goes to there's sharon uh, there's tuck's mother there's her father uh are there are there any threads out there on, from this story that you find particularly tantalizing that you would think, oh man, I'd like to, I'd like to explore that a little more. It's funny, I haven't, but when, but you asking that makes me think, oh, maybe Agnes, when Agnes is like, oh, there you go, early twenties. Yeah. yeah, that could be fun. Maybe, yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. No, I think where my mind mostly goes, I I haven't seriously thought about, <clears throat> you know, doing a continuation of the story in any way. But I think, you know, the ending invites us to wonder about the continuation. Yeah, exactly. Because um, the story the story doesn't really end. I mean, it, obviously the book ends, yeah. but the lives continue. The story goes yeah. on. And, uh, and to me, the biggest question is like, you know, where does Paul's life go? I feel fairly certain that, you know, Tuck and Agnes are going to be OK. It's going to take them a while. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to find themselves in some interesting situations. But in the end, they're going to be okay yeah. you know paul is the one we just don't know about yeah, and so I, I don't have as much optimism for paul but uh you know it's hard yeah it's hard. and i mean the, the sort of subtext to that is that you know this book is very clearly set during the trump years i mean maybe not very clearly but i think if you're paying any attention at all you can figure out it's set during the trump years um which means that right on the heels of what we, you know, the time frame that we have in this story, we have, you know, enter pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. 
enter shutdown basically of all services for people experiencing addiction, right? We have like overdose rates soaring, people not able to get the help that they need. So that made me worry for Paul, like just current, the current events uh, of the day after I finished this writing, writing this book um, made it feel less open-ended to me yeah. where I thought, oh, Paul might be, he might be doomed. Like I, when I was writing and I felt like there was this question of whether Tuck's choice was, you know, the greatest act of love she could have given him, which I think, I think it was, you know, she, she was able to do for Paul what she wasn't able to do for the horses, you know, that, that mare who had had its, um, right. well, was stapled rather than stitched up. Like she couldn't terrify that mare in order to save its life, which is what needed to happen. And right. I think in, you know, at the end of this book, she has found the power to do something that is going to terrify Paul just absolutely. And he's, and he's going to go one way or the other. You know, it's just... Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so I guess when I finished writing the book, I felt um, like that was the question. Like, was that the act of tough love, the act of tough love that Paul needed to get himself together? Um, and I felt like 50 50. I was like, I don't know which way this is going to go, but I think there's a I think there's a chance for him. Maybe they yeah. even find each other again. Um, but then with when yeah, the pandemic hit and things unrolled, unraveled the way that they did, I sort of felt less hopeful for him. Yeah. Well, I'll close with one other question. So we, people always want to know if there's not going to be a sequel, what is next? Because several of these comments I should note had at the bottom, keep writing. Do you have oh, anything? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I wish I was. Yeah. What I, um, what I found was that writing this book, um, it took like six years. I had a young child. I was working full time, dealing with some difficult stuff. And I um, put everything into writing this book. Um, and I wouldn't do it a different way. I do think that this book saved me. I do think this book was my way through that period of life. So I'm glad I did it. But what I have found in the aftermath is that there was a lot that I wasn't <laughs> tending to. So uh -huh. this is sort of a period of just like, I like I just have to get the house in order. Um, yeah. I am writing a little bit here and there, mostly um, short fiction, a little bit of nonfiction. Um, but I, I don't yet have like a great sense of how any of these pieces might develop into a, a larger project. Um, that, that'll happen when you're driving around with your sticky notes. All of a sudden, I know. You're, you're, and I try to, I try to tell myself there are these like two schools of thought. They're the people who tell you you're only a real writer if you sit down and you make yourself write every day. Yeah. And then there's this other school, which I think I've always a little bit more like adhered to, which is um, you're a real writer if you write when you actually have something to say, not just because you want to publish another book or what have you. So I have this feeling that I will write another book, but I also have this feeling that it might be in like seven or eight more years, not okay. yeah. next year. Well, we'll, we'll wait. How's that? Thanks. <laughs> well, Megan, I, there's so much more we could talk about. Uh, and unfortunately, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but uh, I just want to thank you for this. It's a great kickoff for this year. And uh, March is always one of my more difficult months and uh in terms of just my psyche you know and waiting yeah. for summer and all that and as i read this book uh it matched that even though the book takes place in the summer primarily uh it, it was a great you know people say something's a really good beach book well this was a great march book it really was <laughs> <laughs> it really captured the mood for me and uh, i want to thank you for that and uh, and thank you for taking the time tonight to talk uh, so eloquently about what you did. And congratulations too on the first novel. That's a big a big step. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. This is such a pleasure. Okay, great. Uh, I also want to thank all of you out there for joining us uh, on our our first gathering this year. Uh, there will be many more. 
And uh, I want to give another shout out to our sponsors, Bull Moose and Coffee by Design for, for supporting us on this series. Our next book club meeting will be in April when we will take on The Road to Dalton by Shannon Bowring. Uh, so get to it. I'm Bill Nemitz, and I wish you all a happy beginning to spring and good night. We'll see you next month.